First, we call this session the OVF Minute. And the idea was that anyone from the audience could come up for one minute. And a lot can be done in a minute. We all know that. A really good minute is a really good minute. Um, but it wasn't taking off. People weren't signing up until we gave the panel a real name. And that's the Emerging Technologies, um, wait, Survey of Emerging Technologies, which was just sort of a creative way of saying rapid fire session. I know I'm not supposed to use the gun thing, but rapid fire session is the only way I can really describe it. These people are on a clock. They have four minutes. Um, if they don't get through their stuff, they have one minute left to wrap it up, and we move on to the next one. If there's extra time, we can take people up from the audience who want to present their brilliant idea. Um, and I'm just going to get started now. Now, uh, you may think this is uh, sort of odd to have the post office be in the emerging tech, uh, but I kind of liked it. Uh, so we're going to start with James Clark, who's a chief warrant officer, uh, chief of operations from the Military Postal Agency. He's going to tell us about um, the MPSA, that's the Military Postal Service Agency, action report. They used a new label, and they helped a lot of voters send their ballots back for free. So, James, please. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm the timekeeper. He's me. Good. Good. I, I will give you a signal of one minute, and then I'm going to start to cut you off. Yes, sir. Hey, good afternoon. Um, do, I, do I have slides? All the slides are integrated. Okay. Um, mandate from the MOVE Act, move ballots quickly at, a, at an expedited rate. Uh, so we, we, with the Military Postal Service Agency, worked with the United States Postal Service uh, to come up with an expedited rate that translates into express mail. Uh, so we had to put some the, uh, the networks in place, the processes in place, to ensure that we're moving ballots from service members and their family members from overseas back to the election offices here in CONUS. So we developed the uh, Express Mail Military Service Label uh, 11 DOD. Uh, what that provided us with uh, the means to uh, expedite ballots through the military postal system and the United States postal system uh, free of charge for, to the voter. Uh, Express Mail Service allowed for expedited processing uh, for the first time uh, especially for those uh, voter ballots in the contingency areas in Iraq and Afghanistan. I noticed the customer receipt uh, containing the barcode. Uh, by the way, these express mail labels, they had a unique series of barcodes that we, we could track them uh, through the product tracking systems, uh, through our system, so that we could uh, separate them from any other USPS express mail products. But the barcode did two things for us. One, it, it allowed the customer to track his ballot, his or her ballot, uh, through the systems all the way to the delivery. Uh, and the state election office, but it also gave us the military postal system visibility of w where our problem areas uh, were. If we had delays in certain areas uh, between uh, FOB and Afghanistan, at a transfer point in Bahrain or overseas, we, we, could, we could see that. That's the first time we were able to do that. So we see where these delays were at. Uh, we could get some focus and attention on that and get those delays resolved. Um, so that, that's the first time we were able to do that uh, within the military postal system. I'll finish on some considerations for 2012 that I think are, are, are very serious. Uh, we've already beat the first topic up pretty, uh, pretty well. Um, you know, just a lot of wasted costs, a lot of wasted effort with these ballots going all the way overseas. Uh, for, even though we know that they, they, the voter no longer resides there, a service member within a four-year period could change their address four times within that time period. Uh, the second one there, the express mail label 11 DOD, uh, was difficult to use with the, with the various uh, envelopes that we had to ship these ballots with. Um, some of it, it was so small we had to fold them to the, the back side of the envelope, which defeated the purpose of, of tracking because it couldn't get that complete scan. Um, the third one, enforcing an equitable services to all DOD military uh, and civilians serving overseas. Somebody hit on it earlier today. Uh, you know, we have DOD contractors and civilians performing in the same capacity as uniformed service members. Uh, I think it's just right that we relook at that. Uh, it's hard for us to say that you get it and you don't, uh, but we're doing the same things over there. Um, Tracking capability for absentee ballots shipped from CONUS or from the United States over to our uh, installations overseas, I think that would benefit uh, the state election office, local election offices, giving the same uh, visibility that we enjoyed uh, in the military uh, from those ballots go from, going from overseas back to the United States. Thank you. Fabulous. Okay, well, that's exciting because, you know, it's another way to get the ballot back. And uh, for those who want paper ballots, there's an answer. Um, 
thank you for thinking of the overseas citizens as well. Uh, we look forward to that. So next we're going to hear from Josh Franklin. He's from the EAC. He's got a lot of experience working with voting technologies and certifications, and he's going to tell us what the EAC is doing to help UOCAVA voters. Okay, let's start the egg timer. Um, wrong way. Not my slides. That's fine. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, well, uh, everyone, my name is Josh Franklin, <laughs> and uh, I'm a computer engineer at the Election Assistance Commission, and she's going to mess with that for a second. Um, basically, uh, lately the EAC has had about five different activities that they have been engaged in, uh, in sub supporting military and overseas voters. Um, That'd be the Military Heroes Initiative, a common data format, the UWACAVA pilot program testing requirements, the full set of testable requirements for remote electronic voting systems, and uh, research into other countries' efforts uh, into serving military and overseas voters. Uh, the Military Heroes Initiative is a two-year, $500,000 grant that was awarded to ITIF, uh, the grant seeks to help improve military voting technology and processes for military service members who have sustained disabling injuries in combat. Uh, uh, FAP is also working, uh, is also undertaking a similar study, and uh, both organizations are working towards a common goal there. Uh, the common data format, uh, EAC past two days have been working with the IEEE uh, P1622 group. Uh, it's a standard for the voting equipment electronic data interchange. Uh, it's basically a way, it's been, in, in, it's been a long time coming here. Uh, it's a way for to share election data between different manu manufacturers voting e equipment, but it's so much more than that. Uh, it, it would help uh, the whole process where when uh, I forget her name earlier, where you had to print off a, a ballot that was voted and emailed back and then manually input it and then scan it back in. Uh, would, that kind of data interchange would stop that sort of process from happening. Uh, the pilot program testing requirements, the, uh, this is basically the goal was for EAC to prov prov provide a quick and cost-effective method to certify voting systems, um, pilot voting systems for use in states that require EAC certif certif certification um, in one election only. Uh, it draws heavily from the next iteration VVSG, some people call it the VVSG 2.0, uh, the update to the 2005 VVSG and the 2005 VVSG. Uh, next is the, uh, the, the 2002-2005 NDAA and the MOVE Act require FAP to develop a remote electronic, demon, a remote electronic voting system to be used in a demonstration project, and EAC is re required to provide guidelines for FAP's use in developing that system, and that's the TGDC's top priority right now. Um, and the pilot program testing requirements that I just mentioned earlier will serve as the basis for these guidelines. Uh, last but not least, EAC is conducting research efforts into uh, how different uh, nations have helped to serve their military and overseas populations. Uh, it really goes along with what Bob Carey was discussing earlier in regards to risk. Um, it has three different goals uh, to find out the standards used and the implementation of online voting uh, systems that were used in different countries, the uh, level of risk that uh, those countries accepted when, implement when implementing those technologies, and uh, what entity or party within that organ organization decided to accept that level of risk. Um, I'm going to get off here. Yeah, you're kicked off. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have to apologize. I do think the slides are in there somewhere. But, you know, 30 speakers later. So our next speaker is Laura Potter. She's a business development manager for AB Votes, uh, the AB Vote Division of Connick. Uh, she was a project leader for three uh, UOCAVA online ballot marking wizard installations in the last um, 
uh, election for the states of Montana, Nevada, and New Jersey. She is going to talk about how smartphone technology will change overseas voting around the entire world. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Connect is really a software development firm. We began online surveys in 2003. Then we be added in uh, telephone mass surveys. It's all automatic, of course. And then we began building election management software about three years ago, maybe four years ago. But that was logistic management. And we were very excited last year when we got to begin, begin building the FVAP's wizard for absentee voters. So our wizard delivers ballots to the UOCAVA voters and lets them return them in whatever method their state considers secure. They could be returned by e as a, an email attachment or by fax or just print it out and mail it back. The security level of the state and local jurisdictions comfort is, is what mattered in the end. And we tried to make it easy. It's all interactive so that the state or the county clerk receives an email that says you have a UOCAVA voter wanting to vote, clicks on the link and gets to then see what that voter said and approve it. Now someone here earlier mentioned the, imp the difficulties because of the changing addresses and the FPCA stand, works for two years. Well, our system, if they, don't, if they don't have an FPCA or they have an expired FPCA, it'll fill out the FPCA for them. So that eases the transition for the voter and for the county clerk. Now our vision for the future is that they could use not smartphones or IVR, interactive voice recognition, in order to accomplish voting out in the field where they don't have good printers, good scanners, good um, infrastructure. If you were using a phone that had connection to the internet, it could ask you your name, your date of birth, your social security number, your voter registration number, various, and the new CAC. CAC, the, um, I believe it's called Common Identification Card for the Military, Access. Common Access Card. The various bits of information to reassure the county that yes, this is the correct voter, and then they can, they can just place their vote online. You know, if the ballot comes up, you can say yes, no, uh, Smith, Jones, whichever. And these will make it, these capabilities would make it easy for the voter who doesn't have access to all the facilities that you and I are happy to use every day on a daily basis. So that's our vision for technology in the future. Thanks. All right, taking on the world. Thank you. So next, uh, I'm going to look at what slide we have. So I, oh, okay, we're going to go over to Aaron, who's here. Um, excuse me, I have you out. In the, Aaron's with CITL, Secure Electronic Voting. He's our project manager in the U.S. and works on electoral modernization projects. He's going to talk about real application of software independence and universal verifiability in remote electronic voting. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Any directions here? Just hit the right side. Okay, great. Good afternoon. Okay, good. Well, thank you all for having us. I want to start and just introduce CIDL. We are, <clears throat> excuse me, a company that's constantly looking into uh, where the research is going in electronic voting and how we can make the, the process more secure uh, and how we can advance that. And so today is uh, to introduce something uh, that, was, that was started this morning to talk about the end-to-end uh, -end verification in remote electronic voting. And so CIDL is doing this in a very real way. We're, um, we're accomplishing this end-to-end -end verification by providing uh, cast as intended verification to the voters, recorded as cast verification, and counted as recorded verification. We're doing this in two ways. Number one, by providing the uh, voter verification through, uh, through advancements in technologies with advanced cryptography and return codes. We're providing uh, counted as, a, excuse me, 
counted as recorded and universal verification through uh, re-encryption mixnets, mixnets with uh, Elgamel uh, encryption technologies. I, I hope that's meaningful to, to some of you. That's, that's why I offer it out there. These are, these are very high claims, and so I want to offer at least uh, an intro into how we're achieving these things. Uh, down here at the bottom, it looks like my slides have, have been cut off, but we're doing this uh, in a number of ways. One with um, advancements in cryptography, including Elgamel and the homomorphic properties of Elgamel, uh, zero knowledge proofs, uh, voter receipts, which you can't see there at the bottom. What I really want to present to you today, though, is how we're doing this in real application in the country of Norway in their Evo project. Uh, some of the ways this is being done is uh, we're achieving uh, EAL 4 plus common criteria certification. And for those of you who aren't aware, that's a uh, security uh, process and certification that's done under an ISO standard, which requires a lot of what was discussed this morning by the gentleman from the Department of Homeland Security talking about supply chain management, secure coding practices, many of the things that go into reassuring that the software that you're getting is, um, is what we say it is as a vendor. Uh, this is also a publicly disclosed source and is going to be used in uh, many of their elections, their county municipal parliamentary elections. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this is we support over a thousand different combinations of browser operating system um, combinations. So when you think about all the different permutations of, of Linux and Windows and all the various end user environments that you have to deal with as a, a vendor of web-based technology. So we're, we're doing this um, in over a thousand different combinations and, and that's being verified as well. Um, this is um, kind of a messed up thing, but I wanted to offer uh, our contact information to you. And feel free to, uh, now that we have, I think I probably have one of the shortest presentations. Um, so questions or, or feel free to contact me afterwards. Okay, sure. Thank you. Ah, David Weber from Oracle. I heard you were very witty. So you must be witty with us. Not as witty as Bob. Okay. <laughs> You're buying the beer now. Uh, <laughs> Darn. <laughs> David Weber is an information architect from Oracle, and I don't need to say much more, but please speak in English. Okay. <laughs> that I can most certainly do. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm here to talk about interoperability and data, and of course we've had this wonderful technology from Microsoft failing miserably on all that, so of course I have to get that one in. <laughs> okay, um, I guess I'm here because uh, for some reason I ended up as technical editor for the uh, OASIS election markup language, which is forming the basis of the common data for format work um, that you've just heard about. So I'm going to give you a quick insight into what this all means. What are the techies up to? Um, well, the plug wire sort of mess down the bottom is my attempt to sort of represent what election systems underneath the cover look like today. Um, it's sort of like behind your VCR and your TV at home. You know, it's kind of, uh, you don't want to go there too often. So, um, on top of which, of course, the U.S. has thousands of election authorities, each of which are using different voting solutions with their own data ha formats uh, for handling election information, recording voters, elections, candidates, uh, ballots, etc. So, you know, obviously, why do we care about that? If we're talking about getting ballots to these overseas voters, we better make sure that we get the right ballot to them with the right information on it and so on. So we do care. Um, today, all that wiring and glue has been put together by the techies, and they, out of expedience, always make it work, because otherwise they don't get paid. Um, but the long-term cost of this is substantial um, in terms of keeping this all... Uh, uh, it's like a helicopter, right? 200,000 parts flying in close formation. Um, so what we want to do is adopt a common data format solution instead. And so we realize we need a team to solve this. So the team is IEEE, OASIS, Standards Group, uh, the EAC, and NIST. And uh, as you just heard, we've been working for the last two days on this and come to agreement about how we're approaching that. 
um, the foundation for the first phase of this is actually the UO Carver use case. So what does it take to get those ballots out there? Um, we're leveraging the existing OACC ML standard work that's been out there for almost 10 years now um, and making sure that we can tailor it to the UO Carver needs. We need to deliver it in the next few months, so we're under the gun, as usual. Anything to do with Bob is got to be done lickety-split. Uh, validate using uh, the data that we have from last year's UA Carver. Um, and um, so that's where we're at. And the information that we're supporting is all this stuff here, um, which you'd expect to be able to get a ballot out. Uh, this is summarized it in, uh, for you in terms of localities, districts, contests, ballots, candidates. You get the picture. All this has to be consistent. And um, if you think that it is all today, uh, it isn't. You know, obviously we had incidents of voters trying to get their ballots and their information in the system isn't quite how they think it is, so uh, they couldn't get it. So we want to uh, remove all that. One of the things that a common data format means is that you can build test suites and verification and everything else to make sure that the information is accurate and consistent. So we're going to be leveraging all those benefits to make sure that we can get these ballots out. Uh, and uh, this is going to be the foundation for better election systems. You're going to have better ability to verify what happened, how it operated, and so on. Um, so I think I'm about out of time. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, having us on the panel. Okay, our final panelist is from the FEAP, which does not mean that he gets extra time. Uh, David Byrne, Deputy Director, uh, brings over 12 years of election administration experience to his now innovative job developing new technology, so we expect a lot. Um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, obviously, my reputation precedes me by putting me on a four-minute clock, so um, I'm going to try to do my best to get us out because I realize I'm the last thing standing between you and uh, closing remarks and, and cocktail reception. Uh, a couple of things, what we're looking at within the Federal Voting Assistance Program is that Director Kerry outlined our repositioning of FAP much more from a static website to much more to a dynamic portal. And a couple of items that we're looking at incorporating along these lines and leveraging the information that we collect is uh, the creation of an API portal. Uh, you hear a lot of the, the discussion on data exchange. We want to embrace that. Uh, we want to leverage the stakeholder groups who are already engaged in this process. And rather than uh, repeating the information or being repetitive in the data collection, we want to share that through an API. Uh, some of the API data elements would include our state local election official databases, our state uh, guidance on how to actually exercise or cast your ballot, uh, apply for your ballot and cast your ballot. Uh, also, um, survey data, uh, and you heard references also to the voting assistance guide, uh, the 290-page volume. So the, the more we can do to isolate and allow folks to digitally filter by state what their rules and regulations are, we can cut down on the size and need for a hard copy voting assistance guide. A couple of other uh, items includes the EVSW Phase 2. Uh, we're looking at a grant program for this, and Director Kerry also referenced this. Uh, Included within it, uh, we're, we're looking at this year under an FY11 priority, looking at some of the security elements uh, associated with the PDF and given its weaknesses. We want to work with um, and understand more about what those limitations are, especially when we're presenting candidate information into a, a fillable PDF or an online display. Prior to filling that ballot out, we want to make sure that the voter has uh, some semblance of security measures backing it so that the candidate information they're looking at is truly the valid candidate information. Um, making sure that it can't be hijacked and, and faulty information displayed, which would have obviously impact when that vote was going to be considered for tabulation. Future options to consider, this is much more longer term approach, include digital signature verification provisions that for those states that accept email ballots. One of the biggest things is the issue of authentication um, and the acceptance of a wet signature versus wet signature. We need to move towards some sort of accommodation for digital signatures if we're going to be operating in an electronic environment. What integrity mechanisms need to be in place for a voter to verify the integrity of the candidate listing, especially when they're completing a federal write-in absentee ballot? We want to explore some of those security options as well. 
mobile apps. I think we heard a reference to a smartphone. We also want to incorporate that uh, directly out of the, the API architecture and, and portal architecture. We want to be able to, for voters to pull up on their smartphone exactly what are the key dates they need to be mindful of when they're attempting to submit their federal postcard application. Wounded Warrior, we're in partnership with the EAC. Uh, next week, we're having an uh, initial kickoff of our research uh, to really understand what the accessibility challenges are. Thank you. I'll do my best to beat the four minutes. Uh, to understand the accessibility issues associated with soldiers who are coming back from uh, combat and are suffering from PTSD or traumatic brain injury and how that impacts them while they're in active status and a UACABA voter or as a civilian and fall under EAC guidelines. Let me just, and then finally, FPCA and FWAB redesign. Uh, we are looking at that. I heard earlier a reference to uh, some confusing elements. Because we didn't have time to make adjustments to the FPCA and FWAB to accommodate MOVE Act provisions, we are looking to strike those elements that are unnecessary and obviously causing confusion for the voters. So along those elements, look for us to put out a public comment tool uh, so that we can engage all of you here in the room as well as voters and other stakeholder groups to make sure we're hearing directly from you on what you want to see changed in those forms. And going back to the API portal, uh, we anticipate putting our data architecture plan out for public comment. Uh, look for that by the end of March. And with that, I leave 30 seconds, the remainder of my time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have actually five minutes for questions. And then we'll just do a few closing remarks. And then we have five hours for reception. <laughs> um, not quite. So are there questions? From anybody? Yes. Gentleman here. Oh, Kate's got him. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ed Smith. I'm with Dominion Voting. Uh, earlier today, we heard from uh, some academics and some security practitioners around the security of, of these systems, and I heard a very emphatic no uh, around those systems. And, but at the end of that, I heard, well, maybe as a last resort. And then throughout the day, I've heard uh, forensics used a few times and thrown out there. I see on this slide right here, testing and verification. I heard a little bit earlier about different encryption methods and, and such. And, and so I'm, I left, or I'm, I'm leaving here today, I think, a little dissatisfied and maybe a little hungry for information about how we can do mitigations. Because in between that panel and this panel, was a panel of state officials saying that they needed practical solutions. And so leaving with an emphatic no and no solutions is, is somewhat dissatisfying. Hearing that there might be some tools and such out there that could overcome some of that emphatic no uh, leaves me a bit hungry and a bit curious. So if anybody could respond to that, I'd yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, there's a lot being done. So that was the point of this panel. And let's let David take it. Of course, I have to say this is my opinion and not that of Oracle. <laughs> okay. um, I've been doing this for over five years. I got started in this because I voted electronically in Maryland, and that was one of those shock and horror uh, events in your life, and how the heck did this ever get... Uh... So I've been a very strong <laughs> proponent of uh, paper ballot um, because... I saw that as being the pragmatic way to sort out the current um, mess of the, of the systems that, that were, that's out there today and deployed. And the fact that things uh, could not be verified, there was very poor audit trails and so on and so forth. But I'm encouraged. Now we have this decision to use the common data format. And you're rightly pointing to the slide and saying, if it can do all this, <laughs> then this, this moves us forward. But I think that it's, it's a progression. You know, I always talk about crawl, walk, and then run. And so I think that, you know, you're saying you're going away with a no. What I would say is that it's not a question of no, it's a question of when and will this happen. I mean, three years ago, I was in meetings where people were saying, no way, no hell, we're going to do a CDF. Right? So here we are today, and people have agreed to do a CDF. Um, so I think that as people's confidence increases in what these systems are doing and the transparency and everything else improves, we will eventually get there. Um, but it's going to take time. And I come back to one thing that Bob said um, earlier as to why 
No, for Maryland, and I actually vote in Maryland, um, why were only 25% of the ballots returned by the overseas voters, whereas, what was it, 70-something percent by the home voters? And I kind of think I know one of the reasons why. It's time to perform task, right? Actually, I, sorry, I got the ballot, but I didn't return it because I was too busy working on the system for the overseas voters for Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that I think that that kind of puts it into perspective. I remember opening up the ballot and going, "Oh my God!" As Bob said, "How did all these provisions and all this other crap get on here?" You know, if it's longer than a 15-minute task, and you're in the military or you're under in a high-pressure environment, you have less and less chance that you're going to succeed in doing that. So I think that you know when we talk about the military being able to get this done. You have to think about that, and obviously, the more that you can make this a digital process and, re and remove the barriers for them getting it done, uh, ultimately, that is where we're going to be. But I think as a, as a group, as a society, as a, uh, everything else, there's still ways to go from where we are. But ask me that again uh, a year from now, once we have the CDF out there and people really aggressively implementing that and gaining the benefits. Well, thank you for that excellent response. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. The response to the question was longer than his presentation, but that's okay. <laughs> do, I have to turn this, do I have to turn this on? We enjoyed it. Never, no, they're all on. Okay. Never ask a techie the time because he'll tell you how to build a Swiss watch. Right. Well, if, I, if I could just add a couple things. I mean, I think from to, to Ed's point about where we stand, uh, at least from the perspective of what we was discussed today, the move is obviously towards an online presentation of a ballot. I think there's a general consensus that with some security improvements, you can present a ballot online. Uh, it still will require a hard copy print, you know, wet signature. I think there are some other challenges, but by and large, the consensus lies at that presentation. And I think there should be a lot of discussion on if there's a security element to denial of service attacks or potential penetration. We need to spend more time exploring how to detect and mitigate uh, those security threats, as opposed to just simply saying they can, they're all subject to security weaknesses. I think it's a much more fruitful exercise if we can shift gears, recognize where the consensus is, and move forward towards a solution. Okay, we'll take one more question, if there is one. Uh, my question is for the cell phone voting and um, Seidel, are you, are you looking at accessibility for wounded warriors and people with disabilities? Do you, do you want to go first? Actually, I'm, I'm with uh, Connect and... Uh, can we, you speak in the mic so that it can go oh, out to sorry. our friends in cyberspace? I am um, with Connect, and I had mentioned cell phones and smartphones would be a convenient way with... with interactive voice recognition for people to place their votes when they're overseas. And as we all know, there are a number of wounded warriors who cannot uh, use the keyboards and uh, cannot even use the phone pads. And they could use the interactive voice recognition to enable them to vote just as people who are doing it because they don't have access to printers and scanners could do it. So. That's what Connect is thinking as far as it. Did Seidel have more to add on that? Yes, I wasn't sure who the question was, was for to the phones or to Seidel, so I guess we'll both answer, which I think is appropriate. Uh, yes, we are working and, and have done uh, items in the past that address various things, such as uh, different types of touchscreens that, that work with prosthetics versus, uh, versus touchscreens that only work with uh, um, Non-prosthetic, you know. Um, we've done audio ballots. We've done uh, screen reader compliant websites and various things. So in a lot of ways, we are addressing accessibility um, accessibility issues in, in a wide variety of our products and projects. Okay, great. Well, thank you all. You can stay there. We're just going to have a few closing comments. Um, thank you. Thank you.